Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, host of the Football History Dude podcast, right here on the Sports History Network. Now, before we jump into another sports history adventure, let me tell you about this episode's sponsor. We partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get deals on over 30,000 autograph sports collectibles. They even have film, music, and other entertainment autographs on the site, so there's something for everyone. Perhaps you're looking for a gift for Mother's Day, or maybe Father's Day. Heck, who needs a holiday as an excuse to give a piece of sports history to your loved ones? Or how about yourself? Today seems like a great day to add to your sports cave, right? But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes, so there are no extra markups, and they choose to pass these savings on to the customer. All orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and money-back guarantee. And to make sure RSA knows that the Sports History Network sent you, we created a special link for you. All you have to do is head to shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Again, that's shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Head over there to get your piece of sports history today. It might have been one of the tightest races ever in a National Football League for a championship. It was 1930, and it was between two teams that still play in the National Football League today. We have the scoop on the 1930 NFL season, the teams, and the competition level coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pigpen, your portal to positive football history. And welcome to another edition of the Football History Rewind, part number 67, as we go through year by year, season by season of the game of American football. And we are in the NFL season of 1930, the professional circuit in 1930, and a lot of things going on there. And some exciting standings in a race right to the finish. Uh, that we will talk about in just a moment. But before we do, let's make sure that you know about our daily newsletter. It comes out each and every day from the pig pen. That includes Pigskin Dispatch, our podcast, our jerseydispatch.com and sports jersey dispatch podcast, Orville Mulligan Sports Writer, and many of the items from the Sports History Network as well. We put them in a newsletter, delivered to your email inbox for free each and every day, 6.30 a.m., You'll catch up on some sports history uh, before you go on to work or school or start your day. So make sure you, you sign up really easy. Go to the show notes of this very podcast or the top of Pigskin Dispatch or JerseyDispatch.com. Now, let's take a look into the 1930 professional football season. The financial woes of the Great Depression greatly influenced the 1930 season of professional football. The NFL was the only pro organization of the gridiron in 1930 because really nobody else could afford it or even try to start in something in such a time of money troubles. Remember Red Grange and C.C. Pyle had that the original American Football League a few years earlier, but that had passed. It didn't succeed. It ended up getting absorbed into the NFL, at least one of the teams, Red Grange. Rangers uh, and New York Yankees team did, but they've gone by the wayside. They're even gone out of the NFL. Now, prior to the season, the Brooklyn gangsters William B. Dwyer and John C. Depler, they bought the Dayton Triangles. So that franchise was uprooted and was moved and renamed the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, when into the Big Apple. The Orange Tornadoes, they relocated to Newark, New Jersey. But two franchises, the Buffalo Bisons and the Boston Bulldogs, they dropped out of the league altogether. And they did gain one more team back, the Portsmouth Spartans. They entered as a new franchise into the National Football League. 
So we had about 10 teams uh, going there. We'll get into that in just a little bit. And the season would be similar uh, as a race as the 1929 campaign, as the same two teams battled for supremacy as the New York Giants and the Green Bay Packers were head and shoulders above the rest of the league. Uh, don't tell that to George Hallis and the Chicago Bears because they were right there in the thick of things too. But it really became a, a two-horse race uh, as it got closer to the end of the season, as we will talk about. Now remember the importance of having the best record in the National Football League at the end of the season. There was no postseason games in 1930. Those don't come for a couple years from now. It uh, all came down to who had the best regular season record in the NFL. A lot of it had to do with head-to-head, and it went by percentage points. Uh, you know, you're just like you do in baseball with the batting averages. Well, those percentage of wins, the, the victory percentage, that is what constituted uh, who the National Football League champion would be uh, usually selected at a meeting in the postseason, usually after the holidays. Well, the 1930 season of the NFL, it was about as close as you can get by those standards, mere percentage points. And you're going to see how close it was. It was the Packers and the G-Men. In week nine, both sides had excellent records, with Green Bay had a, a perfect 8-0-0 record, and New York was hot on its heels with a 10-1-0 record. And on November 23rd, they would lock horns at the Polo Grounds in New York in front of a crowd of 37,000 people. The Giants emerged victorious in this game by the score of 13-6, to setting the record uh, to 11 wins and 2 losses, 846. But after Thanksgiving Day, saw them lose to Staten Island, 7 to 6, and Green Bay bounced back, defeating the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets by a score of 25 to 7, retaking the lead with nine wins and two losses, an 818 uh, percentage. It went down to the final weeks as Green Bay fell in Week 13 to the Chicago Bears by three scores, while New York outlasted the Frankfurt 11 by a touchdown. The standings were tighter than ever as New York stood at 13 and 4 a mere .004 behind the 10-3 Green Bay Packers. Green Bay had one game remaining, but the New York Giants, their season was done. They were locked in at 13-4, and and Green Bay had to win this game or tie against the Portsmouth Spartans. It was, you know, all eyes were on that game in that final week. If the Packers should lose to Portsmouth, and they very well could because the Spartans were a very good team, very competitive in their first year in the NFL. The Giants would be assured almost of the National Football League title. The pressure was on the Packers. And in the game, Green Bay scored on a TD pass from Red Dunn to Ward Engelman. Uh, however, the crucial extra point attempt by the Packers, Vern Llewellyn, missed its mark. It was 6 nothing Green Bay. And Chuck Bennett ran for a touchdown for the Spartans. Again, this extra point attempt by Tiny Lewis, it was blocked by the Packers, a very critical point in the game, and helped preserve the tie, uh, 6-6. That was the only scoring in the game. So Green Bay, with their 10-3-1 record, had a 7-69 winning percentage against the New York Giants, 7-65 winning percentage. It gave the Packers the 1930 title. They repeated as... Title Town got its second National Football League crown. Remember, it was the first time they had ever won a National Football League title was 1929. So now they double that in uh, the next year. And uh, what a great uh, and glorious win that had to be. And what a race that is. 0.004 percentage points. Uh, you know, all the teams didn't play the same amount of games, obviously. Uh, Green Bay playing only 14, uh, while the New York Giants played 17. But that was their option. They chose to play those, and they scheduled them. And final standings had the Packers 10-3-1, and and Giants 13-4, and as we discussed. The Chicago Bears were right on their heels 9-4-1, and Brooklyn Dodgers 7-4-1, the Providence Steamroller a 6-4-1 and record. Staten Island and Stapletons were an even 5-5-2. and two. Chicago Cardinals were 5-6-2. and two. Portsmouth ended at 5-6-3. and three. Frankfurt Yellow Jackets were 4-13-1. Minneapolis Red Jackets were still in there, 1-7-1. And, and the Newark Tornado, Tornadoes had one win, 10 losses, and one tie to finish at the bottom of the National Football League. Now, there were some stats. There wasn't a whole lot of stats in the National Football League. Not like today with fantasy football. And we, gosh, we know how many times uh, the coach 
and the assistant coach sneeze on the sideline. But the players back then, they really didn't have a lot of statistics that were being kept accurately and consistently. But we do know who the scoring leaders were. That was something that the the players took pride in. Scoring was, you know, not as uh, 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 evident and not as uh, easily done as it is in today's game. There was a lot more uh, rules favoring the defense back in those days. But so scoring was uh, very much a privilege and a premium. And the leader of the National Football League that year was a player for Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Dodgers, Jack McBride. He was the fullback, 29 years old that year. He, in 11 games, he uh, started 11 games and had eight rushing touchdowns to lead the league. Now, Vern Llewellyn, who we talked about of the Green Bay Packers, he ended up playing in 14 games, started 11, had eight rushing touchdowns and one receiving touchdown. So he was right on the, the heels there. Uh, Ken Strong ended up, uh, you know, for the Staten Island Stapletons, he ended up having two touchdowns and five receiving touchdowns. And Benny Friedman, with, uh, you know, 15 games in, six scores. Red Grange, six touchdowns and two receiving touchdowns. Ernie Nevers had uh, six touchdowns himself. Chuck Bennett with five and a receiving touchdown. Mays McLean had four runs into the end zone and caught three passes for score. And Dale Burnett of the New York Giants, he scored four touchdowns, three receptions. And we have all the stats there uh, powered by ProFootballReference.com on Pigskin Dispatch. You can follow the link of the in the show notes of this podcast to go and check out our article that we have wrote on this as well. So the Green Bay Packers closed out the decade of the 1920s as the NFL champions. They also closed an era of professional football and collegiate football that many consider the golden age. And we've talked about these last 30 or so episodes of Football History Rewind of the golden age. And changes were coming to football as it entered into a new age for the 1931 season. And we're going to talk about those starting with the college season next week in our Football History Rewind Part number 70, taking you into a whole new era. So uh, we you know, want to thank uh, some of our sources like newspapers.com, profootballreference.com, as we mentioned, American Football Fandom, Wikipedia, and the Professional Football Research Association, PFRA. A uh, big convention happening this summer down in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the, the, where the start of professional football was. And uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, for details, email me, pigskindispatch at gmail.com, and I will get you in touch on how to be able to go to that in late July. So till next time, everybody, have a great, great iron day. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hi, this is Joe Ziemba, the host of When Football Was Football, here on the Sports History Network. I'm very pleased to announce that I will be partnering with the Sports History Network to give away two copies of my latest book called Bears vs. Cardinals, the NFL's Oldest Rivalry. To enter, just head over to the following link, sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. We hope you'll enjoy the numerous stories in the book, which is largely based on the newly released Dutch Sternemann collection at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Dutch was the co-owner of the early Chicago Bears with George Hallis and kept correspondence, financial records, and scouting reports, which now allow us to peek into the management of an NFL club during the first few years of the league's existence. Along the way, we'll meet unusual gridiron characters from years gone by, including a quarterback who could throw the ball farther behind his back than he could throwing it forward, a Bears lineman who was such a good tavern fighter 
that he decided to enter the boxing universe, and a Cardinals halfback who gave up the NFL rushing title by deciding to not show up for his team's final game of the season. And can we forget the time the Al Capone mob interrupted a Bears-Cardinals game? The new book was fun to research, and I hope you'll enter our free contest today. Once the winners are selected, we'll be in touch regarding shipping as well as to inscribe the book personally for you. This might make a perfect gift for Mother's or Father's Day or simply add it to your own personal collection. Once again, enter by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Thank you and good luck.